Welcome to my American History PowerPoint on New World Beginnings, 33,000 BC to 1769 CE. And this is part one. So this was a rather long chapter. So I decided to organize it into two, divide it into two parts. Um, so it's not quite so long. Um, so I'm trying to keep these PowerPoints to about 30 to 40 minutes. So I figured anything longer, you know, would would not be able to be uh, of interest much longer than that and would cut into if you're using this in a classroom setting, it would not be a, a valuable asset to you much beyond that. So I divided this particular lecture into two parts that I, I, will par I will post the second part in a, in a few days as soon as I finish uh, touching it up. Again, this is um, Miss Kim, and we are going to be talking about new world beginnings. So if you're, have, um, if you're also watching my world history series, we're going to cover some of the same information. So these, this lecture and my lecture in world history, prehistory, kind of worked in tandem. So they, they do work together. So you can actually watch them and, and get different takes on the same information. So they're both valuable. Even in a US history class, you can use the world history prehistory video as well. And just get a, kind of get a different take on the same topic information and likewise if you're using um in, if you're watching this video um you can use this video in world history it's, again the same thing you can get a different take on the same thing so again here's our agenda for the day we're going to explore the origins of new world societies explore the geology of earth and the formation of the continents and oceans, describe the various aspects of New World Native societies, and list the locations of major Native American civilizations, and describe the European groups who were indirect discoverers of North America. And I just realized that my microphone is way up here, so I'm going to move it down here, so hopefully you'll be able to hear me a little bit better. So again, here's our agenda for the day, and again, notice we're focusing on the New World. So again, if you're even if you're using this for, you can use this for world history, but again, a lot of this information does, does a nice dovetail and crossover for both classes. So again, it's a functional video for both classes, both world history and American history, especially in the prehistoric, the prehistory period. So uh, again, they both provide unique perspectives on the same topic, which I really, really enjoy as a history teacher. And um, as a matter of fact, my son, my oldest son came to me today and says, I'm thinking about going to college and becoming a teacher. And I, I, I turned to him and I was like, oh, what do you want to be a teacher of? And he says, well, I'm thinking of history. I want to be a world history teacher. And I turned and looked at him and was like, you, you got an example here. And um, because, you know, this is obviously something I'm very much interested in. So um, I'm hoping he becomes a, a history teacher. It is the toughest job you'll ever love. So now we're going to start off with a quote, which I don't usually start off with quotes, but um, I think this is a very profound quote. Quote, I have come to believe that this is a mighty continent which was hitherto unknown. Your Highnesses have an other world here. This is from Christopher Columbus in 1898, and his, their Highnesses that he's referring to is, are obviously Ferdinand and Isabella of Spain, whom he sailed for even though he was Italian. So he's actually come to the realization that he has discovered a whole new world. Up to that point, he was not certain, but after his multiple voyages, he's, he had realized, well, wait a minute, this is not India. I've actually hit something that's new. So now we're going to talk about a little bit of prehistory and the, of the Western Hemisphere. And again, this is a, a great dovetail. This whole lecture is going to be a nice little dovetail to the prehistory of uh, world history. So about 6,000 years ago, recorded history of the Western world began. In the, in the Middle East, a people developed a written culture and began to emerge from the past. Now, about 500 years ago, European explorers stumbled on the Americas. This act forever altered the, the fate of Europe, America, Asia, and Africa. 
So again, this is very broad brush. Um, so um, if you follow my world history series, we're going to be discussing Mesopotamia, Samaria, Babylonia, and, and that's the, the a particular people. So the Mesopotamians discuss, the, developed a written writing. And here I'm using, um, I believe it's a, a little bit of a Greek, I believe it's a Greek tablet. And obviously the bottom picture is of Columbus, uh, a rendering of what Columbus's sail, sailing ships looked like. Okay. The shaping of North America. And this is where we get into that um like again dovetailing uh, about 225 million years ago there was a single supercontinent geologists called Pangaea that contained all the world's dry land slowly enormous chunks of land began to drift away from the larger land mass opening the Atlantic and Indian Oceans narrowing the Pacific and forming Eurasia Africa Australia Antarctica and the Americas so again, this is sort of a, a little map of what was Pangaea or at some point what Pangaea may have looked like. Again, no one was around back then, so we really don't know. So um, again, continuing with the shaping of America, the single continent theory has been proven by nearly identical species of fish that swim today in long separated freshwater lakes throughout the world. And notice I stress freshwater lakes because obviously salt water can be connected via the oceans. So it'd be very easy for fish to move through a saltwater conduit. But the fact that nearly identical species of freshwater fish are found in long separated lakes um, means that at some point these lakes were combined. There was continual folding and shifting of the Earth's crust that formed mountain ranges. The Appalachians were probably formed even before continental separation, maybe 350 million years ago. The Rocky Sierra Nevadas, Cascades, and coastal ranges, on the other hand, arose more recently, relatively speaking, uh, or geologically speaking, a mere 125, uh, I'm sorry, 135 to 25 million years ago. So again, geologically speaking, 125 million years ago was like yesterday. Um, and, and really, you, um, and we'll, we're going to look at the next slide, we're going to take a look at some of so this first picture with the green, that is the Appalachians. And obviously they're smoother, they're rounded, they're more, you know, softer looking, I guess you could say. In comparison to these other mountain ranges, you've got the Rockies, you've got the Sierra Nevadas, which is this one with the brown and the green underneath. Um, then you've got the uh, Cascades, which is here with the lake and then you've got the coastal ranges here obviously by the ocean so again notice those those mountains seem to be more rugged more sharp more defined so uh, as as water if you think of it like water pouring over a rock in a stream or in the ocean the edges of the rock wear down and get softer and more sorry my uh pointer hit the microphone gets softer more rounded gentler whereas a rock that is just chipped off uh, another larger rock is tougher harder sharper um, less refined so again um, that's where you get your your age okay. um, by about 10 million years ago the basic geological shape of North America had been formed the continent was anchored in its northeastern corner by the Canadian shield and this isn't some kind of like Canadian weapon or anything like that it's an, a zone ungirded by ancient rock probably the first part of what became the North American landmass to emerge above sea level and here I found a nice little graphic of what looked like what what the a Canadian shield looks like and it's it's around in Alberta and Saskatchewan that area so again it, it's sort of parked itself that, that the unyielding rock sort of allowed that landmass to sort of push and park itself there and so it's not going anywhere again the tidewater area and when we talk about tidewater we're talking along the east coast of the united states which is where i'm from um and i'm specifically from maryland and we i live in the what would be considered the tidewater region of the, of maryland 
The tidewater area uh, sloped upwards to the Appalachians, and that which then sloped downward to the mid-continental basin that rolled to the Mississippi ri River Valley, then rose to the peaks of the Rockies, then fell off to the Intermountain Great Basin, bounded by the Rockies on the east to the Sierra Nevadas and the Cascades on the west. We then have the valleys of the Sacramento and San Joaquin Rivers and the Willamette Puget Sound Trough, finally meaning the Pacific and the Coast Ranges. So this, this is kind of a, a topographical map of the U.S. and it just kind of went east to west across the country and so you can kind of see that topology here in this map. So now we're going to, if you're following my, my, uh, my um, world history a lecture, we talked briefly about the Great Ice Age, so we're going to return to that topic briefly. The Great Ice Age began about two million years ago with two mile thick ice sheets sliding over the land. This ice age covered parts of Europe, Asia, and the Americas. In North America, the ice covered all of Canada and the U.S. down to the, to Pen the Pennsylvania, Ohio country, the Dakotas, and the Pacific Northwest. When the glaciers retreated about 10,000 years ago, the landscape looked much like it does today with some minor uh, changes. So again, this is what an approximation of what those ice sheets looked like based on geological evidence that archaeologists have discovered. Now we're going to get into peopling the Americas. The Ice Age did more than shape the geological features of North America. It also helped shape its population and cultural features as well. There is recent, though still controversial, evidence that some early peoples may have reached the Americas in crude boats, but most people probably came by land. And here is the, as we always hear talked about, the Bering Land Bridge or the Bering Strait, the land bridge that between um, Russia and Alaska. When the Ice Age solidified the Earth's oceans, it exposed a land bridge that connected Eurasia with North America in the area of the Bering Sea. Small bands of nomadic Asian hunters, probably following migratory game herds, crossed this land bridge. These immigrant, and I have this in quote because they're just following migratory game patterns. And these immigrant ancestors of Native Americans continued to cross the Bering Isthmus for about 250 centuries, slowly peopling North and South America. When the Ice Age ended and the sea levels rose, the bridge flooded over and North and South America were once again shut off from Eurasia. Now this map kind of shows how that migration pattern worked and notice how the people sort of stuck to the coastal areas. When the Ice Age cut off North America from the rest of Eurasia, time moved forward for those in the Western Hemisphere like it did with for people in the, in, in the Eastern Hemisphere. And the ice that closed the land bridge also opened up previously frozen valleys. People slowly roamed through the wilderness, eventually reaching the far tip of South America. By the time Columbus reached the Americas in 1492, there were perhaps 54 million people in North and South America combined. Again, no one was doing a census of this. This is just geologically, archaeologically, what we have kind of figured out. Okay, this is just a map of all the different peoples that lived in North America. And of course, these 54 million people didn't have the same of anything. They had split themselves into countless tribes, evolved over 2,000 separate languages, and developed many diverse religions, cultures, and ways of life. So they were a very diverse set of people. So to think that they were all the same was, would be to make a colossal misjudgment. Now, three major groups emerged that shaped stunningly sophisticated civilizations with advanced agricultural practices based on the cultivation of maize, known as Indian corn. They built elaborate cities and carried on far-flung commerce. The citizens included talented mathematicians that made amazingly accurate astronomical observations. Human sacrifices were offered in one of the cultures, with the hearts being cut out of living victims, which were often captives captured in battle. In some accounts, more than 5,000 people were ritually slaughtered to celebrate the crowning of one 
Aztec chieftain. So I kind of gave you the uh, spoiler alert there with what culture it was. So um, the, the three main groups that I was just referring to and their locations were the Aztecs, which lived in Mexico, and that's this bright, colorful um, image here. The Mayans, who lived in Central America, and that's this uh, stone um, temple here. And the Inca, who lived in Peru, uh, in South America, and this is a, a picture of Machu Picchu, which is one of their mysterious we believe it's a ceremonial type site, but no one's really sure what Machu Picchu was actually used for. And the jury has always been out on it. Um, so people are always wondering. Agriculture, especially the growing of corn, accounted for the size and sophistication of the Native American civilizations in Mexico and South America. Now, by about 5000 BC, hunter gatherers in Highland, Mexico developed a wild grass into the staple crop of corn, which became the foundation of their complex, large scale, centralized Aztec and Incan civilizations that eventually emerged. Everywhere it was planted, it transformed nomadic hunting hand bands into its settled agricultural villagers, but it was a slow, uneven process. Now, this picture is actually from a terrace farm in Peru because farming is very difficult in Peru because it's very mountainous. So what they actually do is they actually carve out step terraces in the, in the land and they um, to, to make a field. And so it's actually a very efficient, uh, ecologically safe way to farm. And um, it, it's been a way that the Incans and the Peruvian people have farmed for thousands of years. Now, when corn planting finally reached the present day southwest of the U.S. in the United States in about 2000 B.C., it powerfully molded Pueblo culture. Pueblo means village in Spanish. Now, Pueblo cultures in the Rio Grande Valley constructed intricate irrigation systems to water their cornfields. They were also dwelling in villages of multi-level terraced buildings when Spanish explorers made contact with them in the 16th century. And this is an example of a Pueblo um, uh, settlement. And I've actually been in the, in the, in the um, Southwest in Arizona and been in these Pueblo settlements and they are amazing knowing they were built thousands of years ago and they were even in the hot desert, they were very cool and just livable. And I felt like I could have thrown some furniture in there and been very comfortable in there. It was, they were amazing. And I felt amazingly safe and sturdy in, in there. And it was just, they were wonderful. And I, it was an experience that I think you, if you ever have a chance to go to the, the, um, the Southwest, um, I always, I don't know why I said Pacific Southwest, the Southwest, um, in Arizona or New Mexico or someplace like that, you definitely take an opportunity to visit a Pueblo because you'll find it, it's, it's amazing. It's worth the climb up the, um, to get to them. The cultivation of corn reached other parts of North America considerably later. Again, this was a slow and uneven process. The timing of its arrival in various localities means we can reliably use it to explain much about the relative rates of development among various Native American peoples. In the land north and east of the Pueblos, social life was less elaborately developed. Now, societies in the modern sense of the word hardly existed. There were no dense population centers or complex nation states comparable to the Aztec Empire existing in North America outside of Mexico at the time of European arrival. Now, I say that, but then to every rule, is there an exception? And we're going to talk about a couple of exceptions right now. The lack of, of organized and large scale societies contributed to the relative ease uh, of conquest of the Native Americans by the Europeans. Some cultures that did sustain some large settlements after the incorporation of corn planting were the mound builders of the Ohio River Valley, the Mississippian culture of the lower Midwest, and the Anastasi peoples of the Southwest. So these are the three exceptions to the rule. For example, the Mississippian settlements at uh, Cahokia near present day East St. Louis was home 
at one time to as many as 25,000 people. Anastasi also had an elaborate, immense pueblo of more than 600 interconnected rooms at Chaco Canyon in modern day New Mexico. However, mysteriously, perhaps due to prolonged drought, all of these ancient cultures fell into decline by about six, uh, I'm sorry, by about 1300 of uh, CE or the common era. Cultivation of maize, as well as high yielding strains of beans and squash reached the southeastern Atlantic seaboard of North America by 1000 CE common era. These plants made three sister farming possible and I have a, a graphic of what three sister farming is. In this farming method, beans grew on the trellis of the corn stalks while squash covered the planting mounds to retain moisture in the soil. Now this is a very environmentally friendly and clever and, and actually provided a rich diet of nutrients for each crop, leading to high population densities among them, the Creek, the Choctaw, and the Cherokee peoples. So uh, a lot of people still practice three sister farming in varying forms. And you do have to be careful when practicing three sister farming, because if you mix the wrong things, you're going to get, a, you're going to have weird combinations of vegetables. There have been people who have done three sister farming and they have ended up with planting melons, cucumbers, and pumpkins together and gotten a mess. Um, and they've planted tomatoes, beans, and corn together and gotten a hot mess. Again, you have to be very, very careful when you practice three sister farming. Um, my grandfather practiced it on a small scale and it worked very, very, very well for him. But the nice thing is when you pick the, when you select the vegetables that you're going to do three sister farming with, each vegetable adds nutrients to the soil that the other vegetables take out of the soil. So they, they actually, it's, it's very, it restores the soil. It continually restores the soil without adding unnecessary fertilizers. So like I said, it's a very environmentally friendly and it's a great way to, to farm. And it's, it's very environmentally conscious, conscious and um, it, I, I wish we'd do more of it, but I think too many farms get away from it because it does require a lot of thinking ahead and, and making sure you've got everything just right. Now, uh, I, I subtitled this particular slide, the Iroquois, because they they are going to actually end up playing a massive role in American history. So I wanted to sort of set the stage for them um, in particular. In the Northeastern woodlands, the Iroquois, inspired by the legendary leader Hiawatha, created the closest approximation of the great empires of Mexico and Peru, and Peru in North America in the 16th century. The Iroquois Confederacy developed the political and organizational skills to sustain a robust military alliance that menaced their neighbors, both Native American and European alike, for well over a century. And um, again, we actually end up having the Iroquois building an alliance with the French and the British at various points. And it, it, it the Iroquois were a force to be reckoned with, and they 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 truly were a warrior tribe that was they were a, a fantastic example of a tribe that maintained their culture and refused to submit to the the domination of of the european um, colonization practices now um Outside of these examples, most native peoples of North America were living in small, scattered, and impermanent settlement, settlements on the eve of the arrival of Europeans. In the more settled agricultural groups, women tended to the crops while men hunted, fished, gathered fuel, meaning like wood for fires and so forth, and cleared fields for planting. This division of labor 
Ironically, he gave women a great deal of authority and many North American native peoples, including the Iroquois, developed a matrilineal culture in which power and possessions passed down the female side of the family line. So again, we hear so much about the patriarchy that we, we are actually seeing very progressive thought patterns in matrilineal progression, matrilineal um, leadership where the women actually had more power than the males. So while the men are out there hunting and fishing and doing their thing and gathering the fuel, the women are keeping the home fires burning literally and figuratively, and they're the ones dealing with the day-to-day -day issues that are coming up between the different tribes and all this and that. So they were afforded much more power, much more autonomy, much more strength, much more deference than what we have historically been thought uh, that they had, which is um, quite, I think, refreshing that women have always had a lot of power within, within history. Um, so it, I think seeing that, that pattern of, of female power and, and leadership has always been there and and knowing it's there is I think one thing that we we need to understand that it's not a patriarch always been patriarchal it there's there's always a balance between the matriarchal and the patriarchal and that women have always had power within society the Native Americans and Europeans had dramatically different outlooks on the earth, the land and man's place in it. Now, Europeans believed that man had dominion over the earth and had the technologies to alter the face of the land. Now, this comes more from a religious standpoint, the whole idea. They took that, that the, the phrasing in, in, the, in the Bible of, of, of God telling Adam and Eve to have dominion over the earth very they took that literally um and um they had the technologies to alter the face of the land they had things like plows they had things like you know they had guns they had things like this to alter the face of land native americans on the other hand had neither the desire nor the means to aggressively manipulate nature they revered the physical world and endowed nature with almost spiritual properties now, having said that, they did sometimes ignite massive forest fires intentionally torching thousands of acres of trees to create better hunting habitats. Now, this accounted for the open park-like appearance of the eastern woodlands that fascinated the European explorers. And this is probably also a, a kind of like natural uh, controlled burning of forests. They had probably been victims of forest fires caused by lightning due to drought. Lightning, if they've been through a prolonged period of drought, lightning strikes trees, causes a fire, burns everything in its sight, including their home, pushes out the animals. They've had to rebuild their lives. So they say, when we see the, this, these woods starting to get too thick, let's burn out part of the woods. They did it in a controlled way, burning these, this acreage and it's actually creating a more sustainable uh, hunting area and sustainable um, way for them to live. So again, these were controlled, basically early controlled burns, ways to re revere the land because it doesn't do anything, anybody any good if you let the fires burn uncontained. So doing a controlled burn to make sure that the land is taken care of and then the ash that's created can be folded back into the earth nurture the soil to create and nourish the crops which then can be used to feed the animals which can en enhance hunting and again that whole circle of life and so forth and so on so again this is a whole ecosystem and reliance, the land relies on the people, the people rely on the land, and everyone treats everybody and everything with mutual respect. Despite this, the land being this being the fires, the land did not feel the heavy hand of the Native Americans on it simply because there were so 
few in number. There were vast areas that were virtually untouched by human presence. In 1492, there were maybe 4 million Americans, Native Americans living in the land north of Mexico. So that means most of the population, most of that 54 million people was living in Mexico and south. So um, unaware that their isolation was about to end forever. Now, Europeans were also unaware of the existence of North America. Norse seafarers stumbled upon the northeastern coast of North America at about 1000 CE. They landed in an area, era, area of present-day Newfoundland that was rich in wild grapes, which led them to name the area Vinland. While the Norse sailors were venturesome, there was no strong nation-state yearning to expand, so their flimsy settlements were soon abandoned and forgotten, except in Scandinavian saga and song. Okay, now this is a map that, um, this is a, uh, this is called the Sebastian Munster 1546 map of the, of the Western Hemisphere, of the New World, as they called it. Um, and Sebastian, this was, this was a map that he drew that based on what others had seen and, 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 ex and uh, explored. So uh, obviously it's got some issues, um, but you're going to use this to answer one of my extension questions um, that will be attached in on the uh, website or on, um, it'll be, ex it'll be on the website. So um, just use this map, you can print it out. And I'll also include a copy of the map with the questions. Now, for several centuries there, uh, thereafter, restless Europeans, together with the growing power of ambitious governments, sought contact with the wider world, whether for conquest or trade. This began the age of exploration in earnest, setting off a worldwide chain of events that led to a drive towards Asia, the penetration of Africa, and completely accidental discovery of the New World. And when I say accidental discovery, uh, I should rephrase that and say Europeans discovery of the new world because we have to understand that we have a whole 54 million people who've already discovered this this world this new world Christian Crusaders now this is one of the interesting ones as an indirect discoverer of the new world Christian Crusaders must necessarily rank high among in America's indirect discoverers from the 11th to the 14th century so we're going to get in the way back machine Thousands of armor-clad warriors tried relentlessly to wrest control of the Holy Land from the Muslim Empire. Foiled in their attempts, the Crusaders did, however, develop a taste for the exotic delights of Asia. Silk for clothing, drugs for aches and pains, perfumes for unwashed bodies, colorful drapes for dark castles, and spices such as sugar, which was rare in Europe. For preserving and which was rare in Europe for preserving flavored food. The European sweet tooth would have profound implications for history. So again, a little foreshadowing there. These luxuries were prohibitively expensive as they had to be transported huge distances from places like Indonesia, China, and India on both ship and camel. By water, the routes covered the Indian Ocean, Persian Gulf, and the Red Sea. The land routes covered Asia and the Arabian Peninsula, ending at the ports of the Eastern Mediterranean. In addition to all this, Muslim middlemen exacted a heavy toll in route, 80, adding to the overall costs. By the time the goods reached the Italian merchants of Venice and Genoa, both purchasers and profits were narrowly limited. Now, we want to save time and money, save time and money. European consumers and distributors were highly motivated to find a less expensive, more efficient route to the riches of Asia or to develop alternate sources of supply. So in other words, if we can't find a better route, let's do it, figure out how to do it ourselves. So that's going to end part one of our uh, American history um, of New World beginnings. Again, you can always contact me at uh, mayorofshadpoint at gmail.com. You can leave me a comment. Visit my website, 
um, blog for more con content at fairandbalancedhistory.blogspot.com or kimgroves.net. And like and subscribe so you always know when I drop new content. I will see you on my next video, which will actually be a U.S. government video. And so I'm going to try to alternate, do world history, American history, government. So that way it keeps it kind of interesting and keeps me fresh, keeps you fresh, and you always have some new content. So uh, we will be back to this topic in a few days. So I hope you enjoy and be looking out on the blog for your extension activities. You have a great day and enjoy.